Hi everyone, it's John. Welcome back to my channel. It's December 21st, 2022, and I wanted to bring you a book review today. This is of a book that I read earlier this year, in March, if I'm not mistaken. And it is from the New York Review of Books collection. It is Lolly Willows uh, by Sylvia Townsend Warner, with an introduction by Alison Lurie. I think I mentioned this a long time ago on my channel, and I left a comment on one of Kim's videos, and we traded a few Instagram messages about it. I think Kim liked it. Let me know if you watched this, Kim, if you, if you enjoyed this. I loved it. Thought it was great. And I just want to share maybe one of the best, or certainly one of the two best novels that I read this year. So I just wanted to say a bit about it, and a bit about the life of Sylvia Townsend Warner, too, who led a fascinating life. This is actually the first book by Sylvia Townsend Warner, who was a poet, a novelist, and actually, she sort of had a third or fourth life as a, a musicologist. She was an expert in Tudor-era church history, uh, the, the music of Tudor-era church music in England. Uh, this novel dates from uh, 1926, was its first publication, and it was pretty much immediately successful. And I think, at least, it's pretty easy to tell why. At a time in England and much of the world, when the life of most women, married or unmarried, was shaped by the men around them, whether it was fathers or brothers or husbands or whatever else, Laura Willows, who is the character in the book, the main character, lives under the constraints of a conservative family, but she feels herself, she feels that there's an inkling somewhere that's more fulfilling, that's calling her name. And that's kind of the underlying premise of the book. The first half of the book is a really slow, deliberate burn as the reader starts to learn about Laura, or Lolly, as she's called by her niece and nephew. She has always been inextricably drawn to the countryside, drawn to nature, despite having spent most of her life in the city, she is the unmarried youngest daughter of her family. And because of that, she acts as a housekeeper and caretaker for her elderly father. Her father passes away, and despite having been willed a substantial income of her own, Laura is highly pressured into moving in with Henry and Caroline, who are her brother and sister-in-law, respectively. Eventually, she moves to a small village in the Chilterns on her own, a village by the name of Great Mop, where she slowly starts to rediscover herself little by little. And the second half of the novel builds up to a witch's Sabbath, written something like an enticing mashup between Nathaniel Hawthorne's Young Goodman Brown, if you're familiar with the story. If you're not, definitely go read Young Goodman Brown. And that kind of ineffable quality of Angela Carter's The Bloody Chamber that lets you know you're not in Kansas anymore, or London, as the case may be. As if the plot wasn't already interesting enough, to recommend it. It has early evocations of feminism, as I said, the fascination with nature, and the yearning for another broader, more enriching, more authentic sense of life. Uh, and it also has writing that is really in a class of its own, without ever being purple or showy. I thought a lot about the connection to the fantasy genre that this book often gets associated with and classed into. And I guess if all it takes is a subject of witchcraft 
I mentioned witchcraft earlier. Uh, Lolly Willows eventually moves to the countryside and dabbles in the natural arts, I guess, witchcraft. It's not anything that is uh, satanic or, or anything like that, but it is a very sort of quiet, understated way, I think, by Townsend of saying that she's rejecting convention. She's rejecting her conventional role in the family. She's almost certainly rejecting conventional Christianity. Um, but be, because of that association with witchcraft, it often gets called a piece of fantasy. I happen to think that the fantasy, the fantastical elements in it are really understated and really quiet. So calling it fantasy might be missing the point because it is, in fact, very realistic. Warner clearly lays out the case against the simple-minded assumptions that witchcraft is just immorality or is just a wish to cavort with the devil. She says, One doesn't become a witch to run around being harmful or to run around being helpful either. A district visitor on a broomstick. It's to escape all that. To have a life of one's own. Not an existence doled out to you by others. Charitable refuse of their thoughts. So many ounces of stale bread of life a day. The workhouse dietary is scientifically calculated to support life. End quote. If anything, the language, Warner's language, is more rooted in a very mundane life lived in a large city and the familiar social and familial expectations that come to wear on Laura because of it and not a scaffolding of sort of repeated flights into fancy. Despite the clear commercial success that the book brought her, Sylvia Townsend Warner was thoroughly disappointed that the character of Laura was received as a kind of one-off, whimsical critique of British interwar life. Several of her friends assured her that the book was, quote, charming, that it was distinguished, and this was one of her friends, uh, my mother said it was almost as good as Galsworthy, <laughs> which must have been a blow, because uh, Galsworthy was sort of like the, one of the scions of, of literature of the day, if he wasn't already dead by the time this was published. And he wasn't exactly what you would call a feminist. Um, she said that when she, when, she, when she read that, was written by a friend, her heart sank lower and lower and I felt as though I tried to make a sword with her book, only to be told what a pretty pattern there was on the blade. And I thought that was such a beautiful metaphor for a book that had been intended to be sort of a clarion strong call and just was received as a little pretty petty thing. Lolly Willows is a novel that revels in the subversive. It's playful, it's contradictory, but of course it must do this being written in the 1920s, a century ago. It must do this with a kind of quietness, a kind of understated quality. You can't, well, at least she chose not to come out and, and be what some people might think of as loud or extremely outspoken with the character of Laura. It's charming, it's smart, it's funny in that kind of uh, inevitably English understated way. It has clear resonances with things like Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, but the character of Laura is, like I said, it's, it's a cry in the dark for the position, the struggles of all women, and not just women artists, to have a space to work, to live and to breathe outside the narrow strictures 
of social convention. Uh, Sylvia Townsend Warner died at the age of 84 in the 1970s, 1978, I believe. And I, if I just wanted to do one thing, it was just to be able to have a conversation with her and shake her by the shoulders and tell her that that pattern on the blade was so beautiful. It's a really beautiful book, but the real power of it lies in the parry and thrust of the sword itself, which I think, hopefully to a careful reader, comes through. I, I really, really enjoy this, and if anything in the review sounds interesting, or if you've read it before, I would really love to hear your thoughts below. This is Sylvia Townsend Warner's The Great, Lolly Willows. NYRB has had some, uh, at least in my experience, historically some questionable curatorial decisions on the things that it includes. But this past year I read JL Carr's A Month in the Country, and this, both from NYRB, both by English writers, and thought they were, maybe, maybe that and A Month in the Country would be my two top picks for 2022. But I just wanted to bring you this review before the end of the year. And I hope everyone's doing well and having a wonderful, happy holiday season if you celebrate it. Thanks so much. Bye.